Hey, this is Joel Duff. Welcome back to the channel. Today, I'm on the YouTube channel Creation Research. It's a um, Australian um, channel um, devoted to young earth creation. Um, so I'll, I think all these panelists here are Australian and they are answering a variety of different questions. And um, I this one caught my attention. All right, it comes from Doki Doki Bible Club, who's a frequent visitor of Standing for Truth. I would say likes to throw kind of like the softball questions out there, right? For the young earth creationist uh, host or guest in order to give them something to talk about. Uh, and so here, this person comes up with this question. How come we don't have eyeballs for x-ray vision, ultraviolet light, and the seeing distance of eagles? And really, this is a, you know, it, it's a question that is critiquing evolutionary biology. Right, because it really is the question: Why doesn't why don't humans or even other creatures why don't they evolve eyes right as good as eagles? I mean, even eagles have awesome eyes; they can see better than we can. In fact, there's a lot of different organisms out there that can see better than human beings. Or why don't we have other skills like X-ray vision, right? Or the ability to see ultraviolet light? After all, there are other insects and, and other organisms that can see ultraviolet uh, wavelengths of light, and we can't. Why haven't we evolved those capacities? Right? What's, what, what's the limitation there? How come it is we don't have the best of all skills? And uh, so this is thought to be a critique of evolutionary biology, that, that evolution can't explain this. Uh, and I think that that's what they were hoping to get out of the um, the, the panel here is some kind of response uh, about why creationism is the best explanation for why we don't have eagle eyes. Uh, but let's listen to what the panel actually has to say. This is just a two minute video. I probably won't even play the whole thing. I'll skip ahead because it's very easy to get the theme of what their answer is. What's their basic answer? for x-ray vision, ultraviolet light, and the seeing distance of eagles. Diane, you've got to handle that because I suspect my brain would burn out if I had x-ray vision. <laughs> um, there are some uh, creatures that can see ultraviolet light simply because, uh, remember those cone cells, some, some see blue, some see red, some see uh, green. Okay, great. We're noting that there are some other animals that can see ultraviolet light, right? So acknowledging that there are organisms that, well, we're, she's going to acknowledge that also that, you know, that other organisms like eagles can see like eagles uh, and we can't. So there are differences in organisms on earth. The question is, how do we explain those differences? Like, why are there differences in eyesight ability? In that's to do with the, they actually have to be tuned to a particular wavelength. Um, so again, even if we go down to the subcellular level, we see incredibly clever design. Uh, so just like any sort of um, energy receiver um, has to be tuned to a particular wavelength. Uh, so <clears throat> ours just aren't, ours aren't tuned to ultraviolet light it's probably just as well we can't the, the world would be just too the seeing distance of, of eagles um, is to do with the structure of the retina if, if you look at a bird's retina um, it does have a slightly different structure particularly the very very central part of it and also their um, their focusing our, our lenses are designed to focus at a particular distance um, so we're not designed to be flying up in the air, looking at things down on the ground, so we don't need to be able to focus things that far away. So we are designed to live in the world that we live in, walking around on the ground, uh, and it works well. All right, so we are designed to live in the world that we live in, and it works well. Right? The, whole, the whole answer just came down to we're designed to be able to do this because that's we live in a world where we don't need ultraviolet vision um we don't need to be able to see like eagles to survive and eagles do need to see uh, as they do in order to survive in their particular world that's a perfectly reasonable response but it misses a great opportunity and it also doesn't really answer the question 
why can't we evolve superpowers, right? If you think of Eagle's vision as a superpower, uh, it's a superpower relative to our vision. Why can't we do that? She's giving an explanation why we don't, right? Because we're part of it is we're just created that way, right? We were given eyes with a certain shape and has a certain number of cone cells in the center with a certain density. And that provides the type of vision and the quality of vision that we have. And eagles have been given a different set of design specs, right? For the eagle eye that allows them to see uh, in greater detail from, from a farther distance. Um, and so that could be explained as original design. Um, but the question is, why do, wouldn't we be able to evolve that capacity? Why can't we change? Why can't, why, why isn't there the ability to change from one to the other? Could humans evolve eyesight as good as eagles? And so I want to answer that question because I think it's really interesting to think about, um, why we don't have superpowers or why actually we don't have skills that are as good as you think about every single one of your senses uh, and you go look out at the world around us and you'll be able to find an animal that has a better all right or we'll say a a finer scale version of what we have a heightened ability to be able to smell all right uh, better vision all right probably more sensitive to touch well, actually able to, like in case of snakes, able to be able to, to receive uh, signals of heat, all right, and be able to see that type of heat, right? So different forms of vision that we don't have. Um, and so it's an intriguing question to ask, like, why do organisms have the set of capacities they have? And the simple answer could be as given here, which is just like, well, that's the way they're designed. Um, and they do hit upon one really important thing right? She does really says a really important thing. Organisms live in a niche. They live in a particular environment and they have a certain suite of skills, all right, that are adapted for that particular environment. Ah, but see, that's where, that's where it gets interesting. How are they adapted to that particular environment? I just did another video on, um, you know, the young earth creationist response to uh, desert adaptions, like vultures, like having an adaption to, to eating carry-on uh, and living in an extremely hot environment. This isn't necessarily an environment of the original creation, the original design. And yet, so yet they live today in a different world than they were originally designed in. Um, but they have amazing adaptions for this world. So how did they get those? And I think, I, I think the response here would be, well, they were somehow originally designed that way um, and, or, or designed with the ability to adapt right? To change from what they did before as non-carry-on e eaters, right? Uh, because there wouldn't have been any death of other animals. There weren't any other animals to eat in the original creation for, for, for a young earth creationist or young age creationist. Um, and then changing into the ability to like eat carrion, which is something new in the world. And therefore they've adapted to that. Um, so that would be let's just call it what it is, that is evolving those characteristics for that environment. And that environment then has sculpted and shaped the skill sets that an organism needs to survive in that particular environment. But let's go back to just asking the question about human beings. Why can't we evolve? Because let's just, let's just stick with the question. Why can't we, why don't we have eyeballs for x-ray vision or ultraviolet light? Um, all right. So, we live in different ecological niches. Let's start there, All right? So that I just said, right? Um, I don't live in an environment where I need to be able to say ultraviolet light in order to survive. I'm not an insect that needs to be able to see the ultraviolet uh, patterns on a flower in order to be attracted to that flower to get my pollen in order for me to survive. If I could see ultraviolet light, um, yes, I would. I would have a different vision of the world. But if it doesn't add something to my ability to survive in this world, to procure food, all right, to, to prevent myself from being hurt, um, then it doesn't provide some, then there isn't a necessity for that particular characteristic. And from, a, um, from an evolutionary perspective, if there isn't any necessity for something, there's not going to be, that character is not going to evolve right? The environment's not going to 
select for traits in that particular organism to, uh, uh, let's say, um, meet that challenge. The challenge being, hey, there's ultraviolet signals in this world that if you were able to see them would actually help you to survive. Maybe you could survive before, but you could survive better. You could thrive if you developed a new sensor for ultraviolet light. And then you could go into the whole like, well, how would that happen? And there's natural selection mutations and so forth that eventually could could derive that kind of characteristic and be selected for in that environment. But that's not being selected for in you or I or in human beings. And therefore, there's no reason to believe that that particular characteristic would ever come into existence uh, in humans or even any other mammal. All right. Has that has that skill set that I know of. Um, and so that's part and parcel of the fact that uh, mammals are in an environment where they don't need that particular characteristic. But you could say, well, there might be times where a mammal might need that. Uh, but then there's the aspect of um, trade-offs, right? There's always trade-offs. There's a particular amount of energy required to uh, enhance a particular characteristic. Right. Usually, if you have better vision, let's go with the vision thing, because I think it's maybe the easiest to visualize. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, an eagle, um, if you were to map an eagle's brain and you were to ask how much of an eagle uh, eagle's brain is devoted to vision capacity, it's going to be a huge amount. They also have a large amount uh, to uh, spatial awareness type stuff, because any animal that flies um, is and is in motion right in the air and has to have depth perception, all that stuff, but that also interacts with the eyes. That whole apparatus uh, in their brain is a large percentage of the brain, and they don't have very large brains. Okay, so they're devoting an enormous amount of resource of their brain to that skill. Now, guess what? Eagles don't necessarily have a great sense of smell, right? And they don't necessarily have other sensory organs that uh, take up a lot of brain processing um, uh, ability because they don't have that much room in their brain, right? The brain is a has a finite space. It's a finite number of neurons and neural connections. Um, and every organism is in a constant um, state of playing the trade-off game, right? If I get better at this, if natural selection selects for this particular skill to become better, I get better eyesight. Better eyesight. Well, how do you get better eyesight? Well, you have to pack in more cones, all right, and rods. Well, actually, really, I think it's more rods in this case um, for black and white uh, vision. Um, you have to pack in more of those sensors, right, in your eye, and they have to be crammed in closer together because basically, think of it as that you have more pixels, right? If you have more pixels, you have a sharper image. Just like on your screen, if you have a higher pixel number, then you just get a you get a, you have a much sharper screen, sharper image. Um, and so, if you put more pixels on there, right, and you maybe you expand the overall area, all right, of the back of your eye where you where you have the scaffold of your vision cells, right, then you have more area and more individual pixels. Well, that's again, that's just like your computer screen. That's just like uh, when you take a picture and you have the number of megapixels, right? That's the number of individual dots that make up your picture. Well, you know, like the more megapixels you have, the, the, the bigger your image can be and still be in full resolution, right? So for eagles, they can take an amazing picture with their eyes and their brain has to construct that picture. And so the larger that image, the larger, the more processing power you have to have. Right, so um, eagles have, uh, and birds in general, have amazing eyesight, right? So they're devoting a lot amount, amount of injury to their eyesight, but that's what gives them that skill to be able to fly, which gives them an advantage over other organisms living on the ground, right? They can fly to resources. That's the advantage. That's the selective advantage they have. They can also escape from predators. There's a lot of advantages to being able to fly, but there's a lot of disadvantages too, right? I have to spend a lot of energy in my brain processing visual imagery. I also have to be able to fly, which requires flight muscles and a lot of energy for that as well. But the trade-off is worth it, right? The trade-off is worth it. It's worth me spending that much energy 
versus um you know not doing that because my other lifestyle would have been i have to compete with all those other organisms living on the ground and that's a pretty crowded space all right so for us to have eagle so let's go back to to human beings so it's like hey i want to be able to see like an eagle right you know not everyone sees the same way we i don't see as well as most people do uh, but it really doesn't have anything to do with the total number of uh, rods and cones in my eye it's more the shape of my eye uh, is affected um, and so pretty much all humans have a, have a similar number of rods and cones, I believe. Um, and so we have similar vision. It's what we need to live in our particular environment. It has served us well. It's very similar to what uh, the number of rods and cones, the types of eyes that other primates have as well, living in similar environments. Uh, we also have trichromatic vision. Right, we can see in three colors. Do you know that like most other mammals can't see three colors? That also requires more energy, but there are benefits to seeing in, tr in three colors. That is, we can make out different colored fruits and we can identify differences in uh, the quality of that fruit uh, as a result. And then there's also um, sexual cues and so forth that are based on color too, that uh, having trichromatic vision is helpful for. So there are positive selective reasons for trichromatic vision. Uh, but Back to back to eagle eyes. Imagine you had eagle eyes. Like you know, you know, it's like, how come we don't evolve eyes as good as eagles? What's stopping us? It's the trade-off. It's the trade-off. I mean, if you want to have eagle eyes, what are you giving up? Because that's the question. I mean, you can say, well, why do I have to give up anything? Why can't I just have a bigger brain? Okay, if you're gonna have a bigger brain, you're gonna have to use more energy. And your in your brain is already uh huge energy sink right we have huge brains relative to the rest of the size of the rest of our body we are expending a lot more energy toward our brains than most other animals are right and that has given us lots of advantages because i can use my brain to do a lot of things right that other organisms can't do um but if i want to have eagle eyes i would have to greatly expand the area of my vision center all right, so that would change the structure of that portion of my brain. Uh, I would either have to use other another portion of my brain that's doing something else now, in which case I'd have to say, what other skill do I want to diminish in order for me to see better? You're going to have to trade that off. Uh, and you might be thinking, well, why not just make a bigger brain? If you're going to make a bigger brain, you're going to have a bigger brain case. All right, and then you, uh, well, then there's a restriction there. All right, you got to get through the birth canal. Um, and so the birth canal is one of the things that limits the size of our overall brain because it has to be it's a certain size at a certain uh, time in development. Um, so energy and resource allocation is huge. And that is what limits us from being able to, to, to evolve some characteristics because it simply isn't worth it. If you're already able to survive without that characteristic, and that characteristic is going to cost you a lot. There has to be some really compelling reason why you need that characteristic. Right now, if the environment were to change radically, you know, I, you know, all of a sudden, you know, over time, visible light wavelengths suddenly, you know, this is totally is crazy, but because I can't imagine how this would happen. But let's say the sun stops emitting uh, the visible light wavelengths. All right. Those particular wavelengths of energy just they get filtered out by something, you know, like there's a huge cloud between us and the sun and it, it only filters out visible wavelengths of light. But ultraviolet light, you know, still functions. All right. Still comes through. I'd right? say that cloud is just like gradually building over time. So, you know, it's like overall, you know, our overall visible light is, is shrinking. There would be a, a enormous benefit to being able to see an ultraviolet light. Um, if, you know, and so there would be pressure, right? Selective pressure on any mutation that might happen to change the protein structure in our eye such that it can receive ultraviolet light. Cause really that's what it comes down to. You have a, you have a receptor, right? You have a, a protein, you have a molecule that receives the signal and then transfers that signal through your eye. Well, you can take that. I mean, where do you think trichromatic vision comes from? It's, it's a mutation that causes a, uh, an additional a change in one of the proteins such that now it receives a different wavelength of light and we perceive that different wavelength uh, as this different color and so 
it's not impossible to actually evolve the ability to see ultraviolet light. Uh, it's just completely unnecessary and wouldn't be selected for in the current environment. But under different conditions, it potentially could be uh, selected for in, in some organisms. And there are a number of organisms on Earth that have evolved the ability to use ultraviolet light, presumably because for them it was it gave them a selective advantage over their friends and neighbors, which weren't able to see those particular uh, wavelengths of light. Um, and then the X-ray vision thing, again, that's the same type of thing. One thing, we don't know how anyone would actually, we don't know what that receiver would look like, and there isn't anyone that has a anything that's similar enough to it. right? Organisms, in order for them, uh, animals can't simply like, you know what? There's a lot of light out here. What if I could just become photosynthetic? The photosynthetic apparatus is extremely complex, right? In this sense, there's a form of irreducible complexity here. I can't simply take um, parts and put a whole bunch of parts together and suddenly be able to process light energy through my skin, right? I don't have anything that already exists that I can simply adapt. Right. In order to change characteristics, you need to be able to have something, you have to have some raw resource. Right. In the case of eyesight, you have a raw resource. You have eyesight, right? And you see certain wavelengths. And but you know, there are other wavelengths. So there is the potential to make minor adaptations, changes to a few things that gradually shift your vision from this wavelength to a different wavelength, allowing you to see ultraviolet light instead of red light, say, or something like that. Um, we'll say violet light instead of ultraviolet light or ultraviolet light instead of violet light. And, but you have to have an apparatus that allows for that gradual shift and change in order to make a wing, right? One has to have some kind of limb first, right? No one, no evolutionary biologist suggests that, that an organism has a, doesn't have a limb. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, I need to make a wing. So I'm just going to pop out a wing here. Right? No, it's like there's a limb there, you know, on a theropod, they got these little short arms. And if you extend the fingers out and you grow skin between those fingers, or you extend those fingers out and you put some feathers on them, right? You can change that into a wing, right? And if you change the muscle structure somewhat, how it attaches the, the, the breast, uh, you know, the muscles uh, to the breastbone. Right, you change that, and, and you just you can gradually morph that into greater strength, giving better and better and better flying ability. But you can't start from scratch, right? Human beings can't start from scratch to make photosynthetic capabilities, right? That's why no animals, right, have developed photosynthetic abilities. There are a few animals that kind of do a photosynthesis, but they've basically captured a photosynthetic organism and like uh, are using them like they're on their skin or something like that, um, or in their skin but they don't actually contain the genetics and the genes and the ability to do photosynthesis. It's a super complex trait. It can't suddenly appear. So ultraviolet light, ultraviolet light would be one thing. That's I think that would be possible, right? To shift to ultraviolet light uh, under the right conditions. But evolutionary biology really wouldn't have a way of explaining how anyone would be able to see X-ray with X-ray vision, because that's probably a whole different apparatus to be able to see X-rays. And if you don't have any functional reason to be able to see x-rays it wouldn't help with any the survival of an organism then there, there isn't even any selectional pressure to even try to do so in any way no no there are no mutations that could ever be selected for that would help uh generate x-ray vision uh so that's just something where yeah those superpowers don't make any sense in the sense of how an organism could derive those particular characteristics uh, it's called, it's a, uh, you know, name for it's like, it's this historical contingency. You're, you're trapped by what your history is, right? And um, mammals are subject to the fact that there's a certain developmental sequence of genes that develop the various limbs and the backbone and, and the basic parts of a mammal. And all mammals are bailed on that pattern, Right. Uh, mammals can't simply decide like I want to grow, you know, wood or, you know, other characteristics that other organisms outside of the animal kingdom have. Uh, they've lost that ability, right? Because they are, uh, they are on a historical trajectory that is, that has a suite of genes that it has developed 
And now it can only do new things based on adaptations of that, right? Plants are ad adapting and changing and making new characteristics and so forth, but they're also constrained by their own history of being photosynthetic organisms and, and their overall cellular structure and the way they do gene regulation and so forth. There's differences there in those organisms that they all share, but they're all modifying and changing. So, you know, this particular video just, I mean, I've gone way off what this video is talking about, but um, this video is like, it was a missed opportunity to really get into a, a really fascinating question about why do organisms have the suite of characteristics they have? And the simple answer was given is that, well, that's where they, they live there because that's what they do, all right? Human beings have these characteristics, and therefore that's why they have those characteristics, is, is basically her answer. Um, we don't have eyes like eagles because our eyes are shaped like human being eyes. Right? <laughs> like, well, of course. You know? And eagles don't have human eyes because their eyes are shaped differently. The question is how they become to be shaped that way. And, you know, she could still say, well, they, they're shaped that way because God made them that way for eagles. Um, but what gets more interesting is, is that you can look at groups of organisms that, um, um, you know, why would they need that supervision in the original, supervision in the original creation? Um, they wouldn't necessarily need those traits. They're, they're, it, they're extremely fine-tuned for the particular environment and time that they live in today, which is very different than the original perfect creation, young earth creationist eyes. And so even young earth creationists have to have some mechanism or some explanation for how you went from not needing these characteristics, in which case selection and all the mechanisms we know of that maintain certain features, um, would not be selecting for good vision. In fact, if you were able to see extraordinarily well and spending all your brain power seeing well, but you didn't actually need to see that well, because you didn't need to you know, see prey from you know, uh, five miles away, because you're not a predator, you're eating plants, then natural selection would select that characteristic away. Because you'd be like spending too much, why am I spending all this energy doing something I don't need to do? Natural selection is a very efficient remover of excess waste. Right? It says, you're wasting your time. Like you don't need to spend that much energy. You don't, you should be spending that much brain power on this. You could be doing something else with your brain, right? We're gonna, make you better at digesting uh, plant food, right? And identifying the plants you need to eat because that's the environment you originally created in. And therefore we're, we're gonna select for that and select away from your this, this vision thing you've got going on here. So young earth creationists need to explain why it is that organisms can look so incredibly fine tuned for today's environment and how that selection could occur so quickly as to actually have evolved those characteristics to the point where they're perfectly adapted for very well adapted never should use the word perfect very well adapted for that particular environment that they're in right now i don't think we need to belabor this uh anymore i just you know i i i liked the original question why can't we evolve superpowers um, people are like, wow, why can't, you know, it makes no sense, you know, how we would get superpowers in any of these shows where people get superpowers, right? There's no physical explanation for really how that could happen. Um, but there's also no, it, there's no path uh, from an evolutionary perspective for how organisms could get to superpowers that they don't need for their survival, right? That's what it comes down to. If you don't need something for uh, the survival of the species of the population, then there is no reason to evolve that. And there's no, there's no for the natural selection will not actually evolve those characteristics. Um, natural selection is interested in. It sounds like I'm speaking anthropomorphically, but natural selection selects for the characteristics that help an organism survive in the or in the environment that it exists in at that moment in time, not for a future environment, right? It is stuck with some characteristics that it had from the past environment. If an organism, look at whales, right? They're mammals and they have a whole bunch of characteristics. Uh, they have a whole bunch of genes inside of them for living on land. 
right? Why do they have those? Because if they were living on land in the past and they evolved into the ocean because there was some adaptive selectional advantage to living in the ocean. So they entered into the ocean to get more resources than their land neighbors. Great. But they also are constrained by their past. They still have genes for smelling things that they would have smelled on land, but they don't need to smell in the water. Um, and so what they're doing, they, they're carrying that, cat, that past baggage with them, right? Their, their historical baggage is still being dragged along. And you can look in every organism on earth. You can look in an eagle. You can look in whatever you want. And you'll be able to identify historical artifacts within that organism from their past, right? When they did something a little bit differently, right? Because they lived in a different environment in the past. And those characteristics haven't all necessarily been swept away. All the, the information or the genetics is not all gone from that past life. But some of it has been adapted for the present life that they're living in. So can't really prepare for the future, but you, but you are stuck with some stuff from your past, that historical baggage. And as long as that baggage isn't too heavy, right? The cost isn't too high, right? Most organisms have thousands and thousands of copies of genes that don't function. Uh, those are genes that presumably did function in their past at some point, and they're still having to copy them. You use energy for that. But that amount of energy you're using to copy those, those relict genes you're no longer using is nothing compared to the overall usage of energy in your body. So you're not really going to be uh, greatly affected by that. But the amount of energy you use on your brain is definitely a strong force, right? Is a, the, you and I have to expend and eat a lot more food on a daily basis than a lot of other organisms do because just to run our brains, just to keep our brains going. So, the fact we have very large brains must mean there's a big advantage to having a big brain because that's the only way that the only rationale for us keeping a big brain is that we got to be using it for our advantage in the environment for procuring resources because otherwise we should have smaller brains right because that would allow us to live on less you know that would allow us to survive better in an environment with limited resources uh, but we don't really have limited resources since we have our brains and the ability to go out and procure resources in ways that other organisms can't. Uh, yeah, sorry, the lecture in me is coming out here, you know, because of course I just keep thinking of examples that I, uh, that I talk about in class and other places. So we got to wrap this up. Um, how do I wrap this up? I never know what to say at the end except, hey, thanks. <laughs> Glad you're here if you're still here at this point. Um, we'll talk to you later about something else. Bye-bye.